In 2016, Beauty.ai launched the planet's first international beauty contest, judged solely by machines, running complex algorithms determining which faces most closely embody human beauty. 6,000 entries from 100 countries, a bunch of white women winning. The computers calculated beauty based on the data they were given data that did not include many people of color as a beauty baseline, an objective competition undone by unintentional bias. A beauty pageant is low stakes when compared to law enforcement, which has been trying to get the calculations right for a practice called predictive policing. At Hunch Lab, in the city of brotherly love, they believe they have algorithmic law enforcement down to a science. So what we're looking at here is a demo instance uh, using Philadelphia data. The software identifies locations that are good for you to go to um, based upon our risk analysis and uh, policy about what's important to prevent that day. It's things like where are bars and bus stops and highway on ramps and what day of the week is it and how many incidents happened in the last week, in the last month, things like that. So the different colors represent different types of crimes. So we're actually right here in our office, which is in one of these boxes, which is a blue box that represents theft from vehicles. Okay. So the officer can see that, you know, the theft from vehicles is about a third of the risk. Um, the yellow here is robbery, the dark blue is motor vehicle theft, etc. So if I was an officer, I'd go to this location and then I'm prompted to select a tactic. So the software can be configured with different types of tactics mm -hmm. that could reflect the nature of, you know, police community interactions, issues, you know, things like that. So in this case, it's saying visit businesses or high visibility car patrol. So these are the two choices. It's like choose your own adventure for law officers. Yes. Well, it sounds like the wave of the future, but what's the most valid criticism that you've ever heard of the work that you guys do here? The decisions about what is going to be addressed and how it's going to be addressed by the police is immensely important for public debate to discuss. And that can't happen if no one knows that it's going on, right? So that transparency aspect, I think, is the most important aspect of that. And it's often lacking in this process. Transparency was not a hallmark of a predictive policing program in New Orleans, where Palantir Technologies, an analytics firm co-founded by billionaire venture capitalist Peter Thiel, tested their software for six years, from 2012 through 18, without the knowledge of the city's residents or the bulk of the city council. 20 of the nation's 50 largest police departments employ predictive policing. LA, New Orleans, Chicago, and New York. A revelation that prompted the Brennan Center for Justice to undertake a four-year court battle with the city's police department for information on just how the NYPD is using predictive policing. If you flood an area with police officers, you're much more likely to find crime. Um, if you take drug use, for example, we know that um, Americans of different races use drugs at about the same rate. But uh, arrests for minor drug use are much higher in black and Latino communities here. Um, so there's a disparity already between enforcement. If you then put that data into a computer, and ask it to draw patterns and predict where police are more likely to make an arrest for a drug crime, lo and behold, it's in those same neighborhoods that have been over-policed already. So it, it brings it right back to the, the bias and discrimination and bad data question. And uh, that is critical here. We're worried about a police officer who might be racist or a policy that's biased against uh, minority populations or immigrant populations. Uh, and we look to a computer to remove that element of, of subjective bias. But again, it matters how you've trained that computer. The computer is only going to do what you tell it to do with the data that you give it. I think that there's some clear decision-making processes in criminal justice that uh, risk assessment tools uh, are not being designed to solve in a fair, unbiased way. Right. 
But there's also like human processes that also are broken, right? So if you are a, a judge and you are making a decision about uh, some sort of summary judgment or something, right? Yeah. Um, you can often see how many times a person has interacted with the police. And you might use that even subconsciously to change your decision-making process, right? Why should that person see that at all? In our system, we debate, you know, how much information should we give to an officer? Um, will that information be interpreted correctly? Um, some competitors really believe that officers should have as much information as the system knows, right? When we looked at the map, you know, some of those boxes are probably more risky than others. Yeah. You as an officer don't know which one is higher risk, which one is lower risk, right? And we're probabilistically selecting locations. So sometimes we're gonna send an officer to a lower risk location, but they don't know it, right? So if they don't know which one's high risk and which one's medium risk, yeah. they can't use that information to change their behavior. Right. To go around and, and be like, oh, the, you know, something's definitely going to hit. I'm going to stop everyone and yeah. use this as justification. They can't. In addition to, is this going to keep us safe? Uh, is this going to uh, exacerbate tensions that already exist in the city? Is it going to make it worse for communities that are already over policed? Is it going to further erode trust between the police and the communities they serve, making it harder for them to solve crimes in the future? So would New York City, as we know it, be a less safe environment than it is now if we were to rely more on these predictive policing modules? So the predictive policing software, one of the, the big criticisms of it is that it's not always accurate either. And so you end up over-policing some communities, under-policing other communities, and diverting resources uh, because the computer tells you to do that rather than, say, community concern uh, about a particular problem in the neighborhood um, that, that could receive more police attention. So it's a trade-off in terms of resources. And there are serious questions about the accuracy, um, about the reliability, um, about the bias inherent in these, in these systems. And uh, I, I think if police make their decisions based on that, then it is going to make us less safe. We're, we're not opposed to technology, um, but we would like to know how this technology works and, and what its risks are, because right now that's not clear to anybody, but it is uh, impacting the civil rights and civil liberties of millions of New Yorkers.